Oh, g'day champions. What are you doing here? Today I've got a bad cat, Lynx 50. I think I had a brief look at this uh, in a live stream a while back. Uh, but we finally got through the queue and now it's on the bench. So let's get uh, it undressed and have a look at what's going on. So this build is uh, reminiscent of Matchless in more ways than one. Or well, will be evident once I open it up, but it's got a nice front panel there with CNC engraved um, laminate as the the control panel. So that's a a black layer on top of a white layer, and when they when they engrave it, the white layer gets exposed, and that's never going to wear off. So that's a good choice for a control panel. You've got their signature glowy symbol here, which is all very very pretty at night. Now I've already removed the rear cover. You can see we've got two EL34s there in uh, Lyle's favourite valve retention mechanism. Two sort of almost like cap cans clamped on the base of the valve. So they've got to be undone before you can remove the valves. It's got your IEC with an inbuilt fuse holder on off standby. HT fuse is just the standard screw in type. You've got a foot switch socket there. Full, full power, half power. We'll um, see what. Uh, that is controlling, whether it's triode pentode or or something else, different voltage levels. I'd say, I dare say, it'd be triode pentode. One, two. I guess that's the channel switch on the rear panel. Speakers and an impedance selector and effects loop. Now I can see in here there's evidence of insect feces, which is always fun. That's a uh, poplar plywood cabinet. It's a fair bit lighter and softer then uh, birch and in the front there beyond the valves you can see the uh, light up LEDs on a separate circuit board there for the, the fancy logo on the front panel. So just having a quick look before we take it out of the cabinet uh, all the valves have got vacuum the getter flash is still in place uh, this is clearly the, the same chassis as you'd use for a 100 watt version but look how close they would be together like the valves would be almost rattling against each other that's not far enough apart for heat dissipation either you'd like to see at least a I don't know three quarters of an inch or something between them I'd prefer like an inch but yeah says your mum um, <laughs> that's uh, for the rectifier which is a bit of a long story I'll get to that shortly but this is a solid state rectified amplifier but it's got a rectifier socket so I'm not sure if maybe that's an option and they've made it so you can revert the circuitry to to have a rectifier valve um, we'll get into that in a moment but anyway we'll pull this out and have a look it's got our favorite number three Phillips screws with a cup washer and a washer underneath which any self-respecting tech knows you should use the correct screwdriver for not the number two and ream the head out Yet it keeps happening. The easiest and safest way to do this is just flip the cab upside down and get the screws out from underneath so the chassis doesn't drop and the screws come out. All right, so here's the cab. Um, they've just used like 50 mil wide. Ooh, something sticky there, I think spilt drink. Ugh. Gross. Um, 50 mil wide aluminium tape. It's uh, got a bit chewed up there from probably previous servicing. Servicing problem with these is when you put the screws in, often a little biscuit of um, foil comes off and falls inside the amp. I see that all the time in Fender Hot Rod series. There's a little little disc of foil sitting in the bottom of the chassis and just rolling around. Yeah, uh, see lots of cockroach poop. All that all. Yeah, oh, we'll have to clean it up as best we can, but it's already like. Diarrhea soaked into the into the wood and um, poplar is a bit of a sponge. There's actually bits of birch up the front there. Those that's why I pause there for a minute. Those those vertical pieces there are birch, and those bits are poplar. You can see the difference there. Birch is a lot more dense. Poplar is a lot lighter. Um, birch is more sensitive, uh, dimensionally stable. Poplar is not. Um, Poplar is a lot softer and easier to damage. Uh, 
there was an interesting discussion on side rant on uh, different timbers and the cabinet's uh, influence on them in uh, one of the tone talks with with uh, Dave Friedman. He was he was talking about how birch um, is a little bit tighter sounding than poplar. Poplar rings out a little bit more. I think that was with um, James Brown of PV and EVH fame. Anyway, look that one up if you've gotten this far in the video without closing it. <coughs> so there's uh, a little bit more detail of the front LED panel. It's all uh, PCB. Look like through hole LEDs, so no surface mounted. And a strange... Um, Three pin DIN plug that plugs into the chassis. So it's got three wires. I wonder why it's got three wires. Is it, oh, that'd be for the channel setting. The eyes probably go green and red or some fancy shit. So we've got the uh, Tolex starting to separate a bit here, although it might have been that from day dot because it's closed up there. You'd think if it had shrunk, it would evenly shrink. But yeah. Anyway, minutia. <laughs> All right, so here's the chassis out. Now, would you look at the size of that transformer? For a 50 watter, that is a monster. That's friggin' bigger than a 100 watt Marshall. Huh. Big chunky choke there. And just an average size output transformer. Sorry, mate, you're just average. Um, <laughs> see, this is interesting. They've got a, like an adapter plate. Um, it's actually siliconed and screwed to the to the chassis, which is aluminium, and that's a steel plate. And then they've got blanking plastic blanking plugs where there's no. Can you just see how close together these valves would have been? You wouldn't have been able to fit your pinky in there, which isn't good for cooling. Some of the old school uh, data sheets used to actually say the valve spacing recommended. Oh, they sound a bit rattly. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, there's the rectifier socket. All of these are mounted like on grommets for a problem that solving a problem that doesn't really exist in a in a head cab but anyway didn't stop him from going rattly uh even the preamps are mounted on little little grommies and uh like all rubber products they will need replacing at some point and uh heat will exacerbate that so one thing i didn't mention i meant to when uh when i had it in still in head cab was when you're making a head wouldn't you think the logical thing to do would be have the chassis upright like this so the heat rises from the valves instead of rising up into the chassis and heating everything? Just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. You have to do that with combos really because there's no easy way to have an upright cab in a combo. I mean people have tried it like DV Mark and made hideous looking amps. Um, and a few, a few other brands have tried it over the years and they always look terrible and they're just ridiculously large for what they are. So it makes sense in a cab to have it inverted. Uh, a, sorry, a combo to have it inverted, but in a head cab, it would make sense pretty much always to have it upright. But anyway, it's just me ranting. So we're more arse than class. We've got arse. <laughs> arse. Oh, I just, I really want to draw an E on the end of that. And we've got arse preamp valves throughout. Uh, curiously, they had no shielding. I don't know if someone's worked on it before and lost them, but... Uh, I've included that in the quote to just put shields back on them. They they always go missing. Every just about every amp that comes in here's got one or two missing, if not all of them. Um, so I keep stock on hand of just the replacement bayonet fitting, you know, belt and shields. Uh, they don't come by themselves. I think you've got to get them with that little surround, but you just throw the surround in the bin and whatever. There's the connector for the uh, LED front panel about one millimeter away from the transformer bracket but on the transformer brackets you can see here they've used big bolts big washers big thick brackets like that's like it's probably a two two point something mil bracket thickness wise and um that ain't going nowhere they know it's a big heavy transformer so they've they've mounted it correctly so top points for that the same deal on the output transformer they've got the large oversized washers there to distribute it distribute the load um, but it's also like a looks like a 2.4 or 3 mil thick chassis as well so that helps now those valves are shy of the top of the power transformer but they're protruding past the output transformer so i'll just pop a block on the bench so we can sit it upside down without damaging them and we'll leave them in place for now Alrighty. so remember what i said reminiscent about a uh, matchless well in more ways than one it's got the sort of tag 
tag board construction there as well as a bit of point and point mixed in you've got that weird sort of semi-translucent um, Teflon I think it's Teflon uh, jacket on all the component leads just neither here nor there like it's a good thing to do when you've got a construction like this just in case someone pokes around and uh, moves a component and it shorts out on something else you've got a big bank of caps there going from tag strip to tag strip you've got a DC supply up here which is powering uh, the relay boards for the switching the various switching um, arrangements throughout the thing as you switch the channels so they're just omrons on little daughter boards there which are just off the shelf as um, you can get from anywhere little prototyping boards you've got some droppers mounted on the uh, hang on is that a dropper what's the resistance 1.2k yes it's likely it is it's not an attenuator you got the screen resistors there 1k each 10 watt you got the cathode resistors down there 270 ohms each 20 watt 20 watt 10 watt it looked like a 2 for a second but it's the same size as the others uh -huh. So, first suspect, obviously, these caps. Now, talking to my colleagues all over the planet, um, the caps that have, like, two crimps in them, even though they're polarised, like, normally, you've just got a crimp on one edge. See those sprigs made in the US of E and the Samoas next to them? They've just got, a, a like, a crimp, or I don't know what you call it, a little ridge on it uh, on the positive side, and the negative side is just square whereas this one's got one on both sides now I can't remember the brand of these AJ whatever that means but apparently these all fail and you can see how bulgy it is there now these things look bulgy when they're new but that looks bulgier than bulgy so that's my first place I'm gonna look so just a quick glance at the 1 2 switch uh, it's just changing between two values of um, phase inverter coupling caps you got the ooh. <laughs> Bad cap branded caps. That's how you know you've made it. You got 0.1 micros there and uh, 22 nanos there. So there you go. You've got Fart City or uh, Flavor Country. So here's the weird arrangement around the rectifier socket. Uh, you've got the voltage coming in on pin 3 and pin 5, which normally wouldn't be used as you can see on that blurry diagram thank you Panasonic uh, and then it goes through the series diodes there two pins four and six linked up by that blue and white wire there and then via the valve base which is just uh, six seven and eight pins linked together it goes to that purple wire and that red wire. And the purple wire pisses off to that cap, gives it more filtering. Pre the fuse, I might add. The red goes to the tip of the HT fuse and then off to the rest of the circuit. Now this filtering doesn't go anywhere else. That's literally just that cap. So that would have blown the mains fuse. And if it had a chance beforehand, probably blew the HT fuse before blowing the mains fuse. So it's a weird arrangement. You you have to actually modify the wiring down here to use a rectifier valve. Uh, you sort of, you see a rectifier valve hole with socket and you just assume you could just pull that out and pop one in, but that's not the case. You'd have to modify this circuit here. All right, so just checking the fuses. Uh, mains fuse exploded. You can see there vaporized pretty hard so that's no need to test that one that's for the HT now it looks okay it if you just went off visual cues that might be a bit hard to make out on the camera but that looks like a perfectly good fuse so let's test it and she's open no continuity so that is blown although it still looks good so I always tell people don't just go off the visual look of the fuse because um, that
could uh, confuse the hell out of you. All right, directing our attention back to this uh, bulgy cap here. You can see it's got like that uh, Teflon tubing on each lead, like all the other components. And it looks a little bit milky in there. Um, that's actually the residue leaking out the cap. So it looks like it disappears into the cap there. But what's happened is this is bulged out. So they've they've butted that sil that tubing right up to the end of the cap. But when it's swollen, it sort of swallowed it and um, and enveloped it. So now, as the cap's leaked out that hole, this has acted like a conduit and just diverted the fluid, probably down into the tag board, which isn't great because it could become conductive, and um, onto the chassis down below. You can even see that lead in there is starting to corrode on the the ridiculously large um, bleeder cat, uh, bleeder resistor. So that's five meg. Uh, it may as well not be there. <laughs> the self leakage of the cap itself is um, is probably going to make it drain quicker than a five meg resistor. So yeah, that's that's weird. Uh, there's just a bunch of weird stuff in this amp. But I don't know. Uh, Sometimes you think there may be a reason for it, but other times you think there probably isn't. <laughs> so looking at the chassis, uh, you've got that residue has followed the tag board all the way up. And it's collected around this bolt and corroded the chassis in that area and left this residue behind. This uh, bolt, uh, the nut down there you can see, <clears throat> that's the main ground of the heater center tap. And something else there. Uh, no, just the heater center tap, and um, that's not my favorite way of doing it anyway. I like to have an artificial center tap in case anything gets a short to heater, it won't damage the transformer, it'll just blow the two little resistors, and you'll notice there's a slight increase in hum, and then you'll, you'll be able to address it. Um, so, yeah, this whole sort of assembly kind of needs to be lifted up and cleaned under, maybe some nuts replaced, and some, some star washers replaced that are corroded. That tag strip worries me a bit because we we should probably replace that because it's it's absorbed whatever that electrolyte is. It's eleven secret herbs and spices. Uh, this is a just on a side note. This is a uh, star grounded amplifier where all the grounds disappear off. Like each node, each cap literally has its own ground wire. All those black wires snaking under there. And they all go to a central point over here, which again isn't my favourite way of doing it. It doesn't really make a lot of sense from a return currents point of view. Probably not the quietest design going around. Um, so yeah, this cap's definitely got to get replaced just from a physical leakage point of view. Um, oh yeah, you can see see the residue there stuck to it. It's evaporated and left that crap behind. It's probably between all the other caps underneath. So it's made a bit of a mess. Uh, so let's just check it with the meter and see what kind of uh, capacitance or resistance we are getting. Alright, so in circuit, we are measuring 355 ohms. <laughs> so yeah, that's essentially a short circuit as far as HT is concerned. So, just to be sure, like I know nothing else is connected to that node in this circuit because it literally goes to that socket and that's it on the uh, rectifier I just showed you. But we'll just, good practice to... Um, disconnect them and just just double check that it's that component itself that's causing the problem so this is a good opportunity to use some braid because the desolder gun would have trouble getting down at a right angle in an enclosed space like that so out comes the braid and Lyle wins again braid over desoldering gun get rid of that silly 5 meg resistor and there you can see all the residue on the bottom of the cap there and it's run down on the Sprag cap under it so out of circuit, yeah, 350 ohm. All right, so let's get rid of them for now. Just get them out of the way. They've got to get replaced anyway. And we'll look at lifting this tag board to try and clean underneath and what's involved in that. Oh, that electrolyte stinks, man. It's gone up into the wick now. You can see it's just this weird sickly sweet smell, like glycol or whatever it is. It was a bit like burning antifreeze <laughs> or coolant as we call it over here. All right, they go in the bin. All right, before I go any further, I'm going to clean off whatever this gooey crap is because it keeps sticking to my arm hairs and it's grossing me out. All right, it doesn't appear to be water based. So we'll go the next 
solvent up the ladder. Shellite, otherwise known as naphtha, over there. You know where. Advanced hair. Yeah, yeah. And that's getting it. First go. Sweet. So naphtha doesn't really hurt anything. Oh, except for you if you set it on fire, but <laughs> the point being it won't dissolve any plastics. It's it's polite even on nitrocellulose, which is saying something because that that turns to cheese when you look at it. It's all over that back back lip as well, so I'll just clean it off there from when we turn the amp around. Alright, so I've disconnected the center tap for the heaters and we've kind of sort of got access to that screw. Now these are studs pressed into the chassis, so uh, we can't just unscrew them from the outside with, and use like needle nose pliers, which is what we could do normally. Um, this gel stuff on the nuts, I'll show you in a minute. Um, that is not a Loctite, that's not a uh, anti-shake mechanism, that is just purely uh, tamper evidence. So it goes all manky when you undo it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the condition of the lock washer that's supposed to be a grounding point. Now you can see the rust on that tag strip. And that's like the main grounding point, so that's not fantastic. <laughs> uh, everyone puts um, lock nuts on the actual, uh, lock washers on the actual nut. But the actual interface between the actual terminal and the actual, I've got to stop using that word, and the chassis, there's nothing to really bite in. It's just flat face against flat face. So I'll get the other one. Just move those cap leads out of the way a little so we've got some access. And out she comes. Everything's stiff because it's pretty heavy gauge wire. So I don't think we're going to really get much access down in there without disconnecting some more stuff, which is not fun. All right, so now that it's been lifted, we can see the horror underneath, and it's actually spread a bit further than I thought. It's gone to that nut, yeah, sure. That's the transformer mounting nut. Uh, but it's also gone under this one as well, and it's it's followed that wiring on the, on the bottom via the capillary effect, that that black uh, wiring going back to the star ground, that sort of made the fluid follow along. I'm just amazed by the pure volume of stuff that came out of this cap. Like, that's pretty full on, man. It's, uh, it's probably, yeah, it's more than 10cc, if you know what I'm saying. So it's gone up here, and it's, uh, there's still evidence of it down in there. You can see that brown stuff on the chassis. I've moved those black wires to to the right there. And you can see that residue there. But none of these grounds here are connected to anything. They're purely mechanical. So I think we can leave them as is. Those two, again, they're just mechanical. McGurnical. Uh, so I've tested the tag strips with the Mega. They're not conductive. So I think we'll give it a clean with the alcohol just to be sure. And I'll clean up this mess down here. And then we'll get it back in position. Alright, so that cleaned up surprisingly well. Even the tag strip. Um, it looked like rust, but it was like some reaction with the, um, the electrolyte because uh, it must have just been some slight surface rust coming from the corners where the chrome plating is the thinnest. Nickel, sorry. So, uh, cleaned everything down with alcohol, um, got as far up as we could. So I think we're good to put some new caps nuts on at least that connection, because that is an actual ground. That, that one there is just purely mechanical. Uh, and then we can get it back in position, put a new cap on. Got a new uh, tube amp doctor one there, 100 microfarad, 500 volt. A little bit higher in the voltage rating, but that won't bother us. More importantly, it's not one of those shitty caps with the, the two bungs. Alright, so the tag boards are back in place. Uh, the lower layer of caps are back in position. I am thinking about, um, see, you can see that purple wire going to that eyelet there. That's where that extra cap was mounted. And it had this crazy thing um, going all the way from one end to another, spliced extra extended and bit of heat shrink and 5 meg <laughs> so I'm thinking about just throwing a 470 
straight from that terminal over to this grounded uh, point over here. It's not important, it's just a bleeder and that will just uh, drain the cap uh, for a reasonable amount of, after a reasonably short amount of time after the unit's been switched off so it remains safe to work on within a minute or two. Um, so you could easily just go from there to there with a 470 or something. So I might do that. I'm sort of of two minds. I don't want to redesign anything, but that's not really that's not really something that's specific to the voicing in the end. That's just sort of stuff that needs to be installed and work. Um, so yeah, might put that in and just let the customer know. Just on the uh, little nuts here that are holding the valve sockets in. This is a socket in two fingers and it's like, it's not even finger tight. Um, that stuff used there is not to stop it shaking loose because this literally, there's no resistance on it at all. Um, it's just there for tamper evidence, I guess. All right, so curiosity got the better of me. I wanted to find out what they were doing with the power scaling or, you know, the half power switch and uh, just tracing it out. This is what I found. So no fancy on-screen schematic today, uh, I'm in a hurry, so it's a dual pole, dual throw switch, one half of it is uh, introducing a 47k resistor in series with the two screen uh, supplies, or here you can bypass it, so that's your, your standard um, setup there with the, the two screen grid resistors there, and here's your dropper for that node uh, coming from the choke. And this is linked up. This is shown in low power mode at the moment. And here from the phase inverter, you've got your coupling caps or, you know, you've got your selectable coupling caps, but this is just indi indicative. Can't say indicative without dick. Uh, 47K, 3 watt um, cross line attenuator, I guess. And uh, you've got your standard uh, grid leaks here and then your... 10k uh, grid stoppers off to the, the control grids of the AL34. So it's doing two two separate things at once to reduce the power outlet, the power output. My God, man. All right, legends, I've uh, reinstalled the Taddy there. Now, just in summary, you could use a rectify valve in this amplifier, but you'd have to take that blue and white wire out first because that's going from effectively from plate to plate if you had one plugged in. If you cut that wire out, it'd just be like you had two backup diodes in series on each of the uh, each of the plates, so not the end of the world. Um, the other thing is that purple wire that goes off to the cap that we replaced, and it's bleeder resistor, but yeah, primarily the cap. Um, that wouldn't be in circuit at all, so that cap would be not being used at all. Um, I guess the idea is when you've got solid state rectification happening you've got an extra filter stage it firms up the power supply a bit you get extra punch from solid state rectification then you get extra punch from the uh from the extra filter cap there but uh when you put a rectifier valve in it just goes straight to the fuse and straight to the first node which is down here which would be a little bit spongier so there you go i guess that's the logic behind it all right so after my curiosity got the better of me and I dug out the silicon. I've repotted that in electro electronics grade silicon. Uh, just waiting for that to cure, but oh, if I don't drop it. <laughs> but in the meantime, I've just put a wire in there that does the same thing just for testing, but I'll put that back in um, so it's all original. So let's get some fuses into this thing and uh, fire it up and see if there's any other problems that we've got to iron out. Just to leave you in suspense. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna leave this one here and we'll fire it up in the next video. We'll take a bunch of measurements, check that everything's cool, and then we'll have a listen and see how she goes. So I'll see you in the next one.